from Matthew the Nocturnal by John Dowland and Benjamin Britten. Gentle melodies that might very well lure us into a gentle sleep and perchance to dream. So what is a dream? What is a dream? What is a dream? A dream is wishful thinking. A dream is aspirations and hope-filled plans. What is a dream? A plunge into a realm of magic where we can fly, walk through walls, time travel, do all the things that ghosts can do. Wait, wait, are we a ghost when we dream? I mean, in dreams, we meet dead people who are very much alive and sometimes they even give us advice. Are dreams a portal into the world of the supernatural? as all human cultures have believed. Oh, this small cranium with its vast internal landscapes. We like to think it's the home of reason, but it's also a labyrinth in which imagination runs amok. And when dreams begin to develop, we get the impression that dreams which much rather have imagination as their dancing partner than reason, which is why we often wake up really kind of you know, rattled because reason has once again been trampled and mocked by this wild, delirious dance of dream and imagination. Dream and imagination, what an unholy alliance. <laughs> dream and imagination, what an amazing source of creativity like that. The Nightmare by the Swiss painter Henry Fuseli our attention is immediately drawn to that beautiful young woman dressed in white sleeping, sleeping so helpless, so disturbingly vulnerable, and even more disturbing, a blind horse emerging from those heavy curtains in the background, a blind horse, a blind mare, truly a nightmare. This, of course, comes out of these old, old, again, European folk traditions, especially that demon sitting on her chest, right? Because, again, these old European folk traditions, at night when we sleep, when we have a nightmare, we feel this pressure on our chest. Why? Because there's a demon sitting on our chest generating those nightmares. But notice in this painting, notice, notice what he's doing. He's looking at us because maybe, just maybe tonight, he'll come for a visit. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great mind game, this painting. Especially fascinated by dreams were, of course, the, uh, um, the surrealists who roamed the dream landscapes with the butterfly nets of their imagination. Above all, the very famous Salvador Dali, who was especially enthralled by Freud and his theory of the subconscious, of the irrational, and of dreams. Most of us, of course, are familiar with some of his early works, like The Persistence of Memory, um, suggesting, as we all know, that in our, in our memories, time melts, just like those clocks, and you know, time is totally, totally unreliable. And indeed, Dali became a master in painting the irrational with clarity and precision. He liked to describe his work as hand-painted dream photographs, such as one second before awakening from a dream caused by the flight of a bee around a pomegranate. And, and where, where is that bee? Where is that, where is that, where is that bee? Where is that? It's right there, it's right there. So small, so inconsequential. And there's the pomegranate, which casts a heart-shaped shadow because the sleeping woman is the love of Dolly's life. First his mistress, then his wife. Subconsciously, she hears the bee and she fears that she's going to get stung. And there's the pomegranate again, in rather monstrous proportions. And out of it bursts a great fish, which disgorges a tiger, which disgorges another tiger, symbolizing the beauty of terror. This tiger is chasing a rifle that ends in a bayonet that is about to prick her in the tender underarm. A remarkable example, yes, uh, of our fears. Are her fears, are our fears, completely blown out of all proportion by the subconscious? Again, a remarkable example of his hand-painted dream photographs. And speaking of photographs, here's a stunning depiction of sleep paralysis. 
by a contemporary photographer artist by the name of Nicholas Bruno, who has established a reputation as the man who photographs his nightmares. The man who photographs his nightmares. But it's not just visual artists who have tried to recapture the images of their dreams. Writers of poetry, of course, have also tried to do so. One of the classic examples is Samuel Taylor Coleridge, most famous for his Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. He once had a most amazing dream, fueled, as sometimes happens, by drugs. He was apparently an opium addict. Again, a dream of fantastic images and the fantastic, spectacular sort of poetry that goes with it. So upon awakening, he rushed to his desk and began to madly write down these images and these words. In Xanadu de Kublai Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. And then there was a knock on the door. I always tell my students, when you're in the midst of a creative rush, don't stop. The world can end if it wants to, but don't stop, just keep writing. But Coleridge did stop. He went to the door, got involved in a conversation. Some historians suggest it was his drug dealer. And when the conversation finished and Coleridge hurried back to his desk to write down these images, all those images and those words were gone, completely gone. He did, complete, he did complete the poem, but he said it was just a sad, pale shadow of all the magnificence he had seen in his dream. Now, like poets, composers too have heard music in their dreams, have seen scores in their dreams, have heard entire concertos in their dreams, and one of the most famous is the experience of Giuseppe Tartini, most people have not heard of him, but he's actually one of the greatest of all violinists, one of the greatest of violin composers. And one night in 1713, Tartini, he was 21 at the, at the time, he had the strangest dream. He said, the devil appeared and offered to be both my master and my servant. And so Tartini describes this as follows. I dreamed I made a pact with the devil for my soul. Everything went as I wished. My new servant anticipated and fulfilled my every desire. Among other things, I gave him my violin to see if he could play. How great was my astonishment on hearing a sonata so wonderful and so beautiful, played with such great art and intelligence as I had never even conceived in my boldest flights of fantasy. I felt enraptured, transported, my breath failed me, and I awoke. Naturally, Tartini, as soon as he awoke, reached for the violin lying by his bed and began to try to recreate these melodies, but all of, his attempt, all of his attempts, he said, were in vain. He wrote, the music which I thus composed is indeed the best I ever wrote, but it is so inferior to what I heard that I would have destroyed my violin and abandoned music forever if I could have lived without music. It's called the Devil's Trill. It's considered one of the most difficult pieces to play for the violin. And if you listen to it, if you close your eyes and listen to it, you would swear there are at least three or four violins playing, and it's all on one violin. But not just classical composers of the past have heard melodies, entire concertos in their dreams. No, even composers of our own time. Yes, Jimi Hendrix, and one of his most popular and successful compositions, Purple Haze. He heard the melody in a dream, rushed upon waking to write it down. And then, of course, there's the Rolling Stones. And recognize him, he's unrecognizable today, Keith Richards. Keith Richards took a much more practical, technological approach. He kept a tape recorder by his nightstand so that when he woke up, he could immediately record the tunes he heard in a dream on his guitar. He told how one night he went to sleep and woke up in the morning to see that the tape recorder had advanced all the way to the end. He had no knowledge of having even turned it on, so he played it back and heard this guitar riff, I Get No Satisfaction, one of his most famous and popular compositions. He had apparently recorded it while dreaming. He said in an interview, in an interview I don't sit down and try to write songs Song just comes to me. I wake up in the middle of the night and I've dreamt half of it. 
I just need to pick up the guitar next to the bed, push record, and put it down. I'm not saying I write them all in my dreams, but that's the ideal way. You don't even have to get out of bed. <laughs> Finally, Paul McCartney of the Beatles had similar and several experiences just like this. He wrote, for example, I was going through a really difficult time around the autumn of 1968. We, the Beatles, were starting to have problems. I sensed that we were breaking up, and I was staying up too late at night, drinking, doing drugs, clubbing. I was exhausted. Then one night, I had the most comforting dream about my mother, who had died when I was only 14. This, in other words, is 12 years uh, later. She was a hardworking nurse and a very comforting presence in my life. And it was difficult because as the years went by, I couldn't recall her face so easily anymore. And you know, this is one of course, one of the great traumas that we have when we've lost someone we really love, is over time we forget what they looked like. So in this dream, 12 years later, my mother appeared. And there was her face completely clear, particularly her eyes. And she said to me very gently, very reassuringly, let it be. <laughs> it was lovely. He goes on and he says, I went to the piano and started writing. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. Mary was my mother's name. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. There will be an answer, let it be. It is, of course, one of the Beatles' most famous and most successful pieces. So, what is a dream? What is a dream? Is it a plunge into a world of magic? Is it our imagination ransacking through our memories and our desires and our fears? Or are our dreams an encounter with the supernatural? I mean, one thing we know for certain, as just these few examples have shown, dreams dancing with the imagination bring forth the most captivating, enigmatic, and astonishing works of art. Dreams and the imagination, what a remarkable source of creativity. Thank you.